Okay, welcome to our meeting of the Menus and Communications meeting of July. Um, those joining online, uh, we are quorum, there's three of us. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we should try and get through the, the business in hand. So the first thing is the 18521 declaration of any disclosable peculiar interest. None shown, thank you. 18621, apologies for absence, Chris. I've got apologies from Captain Burnett and Harvey. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jeremy last night indicated that last night was not covered. So 18721, the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of June, which were received by full council on the 30th of June. Um, are we happy for me to sign those as a true record? No. I wasn't here, so I wouldn't mind. Okay, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Carl and myself were there, so <laughs> we'll move those and I will sign those as a true record. So 18. 821 marketing report. So I'll hand over to Tom. Tom does the marketing report. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. <laughs> Good afternoon. Right, so to the few councils we do have here, let's we'll go over some of the changes we've been making because we've been quite busy over the past month trying to get everything up to speed ready for us coming back to sort of relative normality uh, in the coming weeks. But uh, one of the things we have done, uh, some of you may have seen, we put the podcast out late last month. Uh, first one out with uh, the Mayor Mike Brindle and a few other video features with it as well, such as the Charles Burrell, Mu the Ch the Charles Burrell Museum and some local businesses and such, stuff like that. Uh, it, it went down quite well, as far as I, as far as I think. I think it got a, uh, it, I mean, it all had a positive, uh, positive reaction and people who, who did watch it said, oh, you know, I watched the... Uh, watch the podcast. It is the first one, so I think this is probably going to be one of the quieter ones because it is a case of, well, people don't know it's a regular thing yet. And also we're all still, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. It's going to take a, it's going to take a couple of episodes to really figure out exactly what we're doing. But I think we're going in the right direction. We've got guests planned uh, for the next couple of months with upcoming, you know, with whatever is coming up. So I think I think that's going to be a good regular fixture for us in the coming months, as well, for hopefully for a long period of time. Um, to go alongside this, uh, we've been working on the marketing campaigns we put out for our events, because obviously we have a big catalogue of events coming up. So we've been putting together a sheet which shows when we've been advertising in certain locations, where, what poster sites have been used for specific events, when, you know, um, what different groups on Facebook, for example, they've been shared to if we've had flyers, all of that, making sure we keep track of that and we make sure that no events are being neglected and every event is making sure that if we're getting close to the time and we really need to push an event, we know we need to do that and we can see how much more frequent we need to do that. Um, we've also been working with the Heritage Officer, uh, uh, sorry, Heritage and Events Officer, regarding making more video content for advertising. Um, so may have seen we did a short video piece on Heidi High that went out last week uh, which is being done to essentially because video content always always gets more interest from people especially when it's online so we've put those we've been putting some of those together and we've got a couple of other things lined up in that regard as well um, unfortunately a little bit of, of a downside in terms of the quarterly flyer I mentioned it last month that I was going to look into or that I was looking into ways of getting distribution done uh, and frankly with what I found it all the costs were far too far out of our, but, uh, out of our you know, potential budget. Um, I've looked into contingencies and that's not ready to be bought here or anything like that but that's again not something that I have any concrete information on so I'm not going to say oh, this is definitely happening when we don't know. <coughs> Uh, that said, the quarterly flyers that we did make, uh, I've, we've repurposed into a upcoming event poster, which some may have seen uh, in the Rotunda and at uh, King's House as well, which essentially has everything that's coming up and will basically display, maybe not ex exact dates, times and prices of all of these events, but we'll say, this is everything that is happening, look at how much we've got going on, you can come check it out by going to the website and our Facebook and so on and so on and so forth. So we are still reaching out to the people who don't so much use social media because I know there are a lot of people who don't. We need, just need to make sure we, do, we don't leave them behind. Um, and last little thing, you may have noticed that we've started putting bigger, less, uh, you know, more fitting posters in the rotunda. 
found a way of printing A2 from here, which, you know, always, always good, cost cutting. Another thing we've done, which some of you may have seen, is the newsletter. Uh, we, I created a newsletter which was emailed around to our mailing list. I mentioned the mailing list last, last month. And this was, this was sent out uh, shortly after the last event meeting. Um, and it featured all of the upcoming events as well as a link to our website and so on. Um, I would like to say that we this was sent over to over 500 different, uh, different, different emails and it was opened by well over half of them, which considering most people would probably look at it as spam because it's a generic email, that's quite good. But um, I'm, I'm a little bit sad we haven't got more counselors in here to really hear this, so I hope they're watching at home. But there's a, out of the 16 counselors this was sent to, um, I'm able to see who opens emails um, or opens the email. And unfortunately, less than a third of all of the counselors even looked at the email, let alone read through it. It, was, it wasn't opened by 11 of the 16 counselors, which is a little bit disappointing, really. Other than that, we'll move on from that. The monthly observations, uh, we've seen quite a few big posts. Um, we're looking at the looking at the branding and the social media as well, because we've obviously, you know, the guild was now being made into a big thing, so we want to look into that. Um, not so, not not such positive news, but the most the highest viewed post of the month was one regarding the sheep on Barnum Common, which which went out from our. Uh, Green Spaces and Conservation Officer, which, while this is not that's not a positive story, having you know had over sixteen thousand views, and it is the very least proof that if we can start getting to the point where people want to share our content, we can hit these high numbers on a much more consistent basis for things that are perhaps a little bit more positive for the town. Um, the other one, which surprised me, that the next highest post was actually the job listing for the town team member. Uh, well, no, that's a that's a personnel. Uh, Thing, so I'm not going to go into that, but it's just it's very nice to see that there was a lot of people who were looking to share that to either friends or families. Like, oh, this might be something good for you. So it's just another avenue of reaching reaching people. Uh, you know, in this case, it's for potential employment. And the the other highest rated post comes from the the Carnegie page, which is the aforementioned video advertisement for Heidi Hunt. So far. So that is, that is thanks for that, uh, Tom. Just a couple. Of, we said we were not able to do the, the quarterly list because of cost implications. Um, is it available as a download of PDF that people could um, take away and distribute to their groups? We can definitely do that. We can definitely make it so it's a so it's downloadable. Is, is it best to go on to the Facebook page so they can then pull it from there or put it on our website or? Well, well, what it does. <clears throat> What we're doing currently is it is listed on the Facebook, it is on poster sites in town, and it is it is on the website as well. If we wanted to have it be, if say for example, if councillors wanted to have it as a downloadable item on a downloadable PDF from the website, which they can then download, maybe print off or give to their local, uh, you know, local community centres and such. I can't see any downside to doing that. So it's just making that a in your face type of thing rather than having to go through the documents. Yeah. On the website. Yeah, um, I mean it's currently what currently the upcoming event stuff is pinned on our Facebook, yeah. on the Carnegie's page, Facebook to show you know this is everything that's coming up. Okay. It's easy to capture. So you don't have to scroll through loads of posts to find it. It will always be the one set at the top. Okay. So it's easy to find in that regard. But I mean, if, if, like I said, if councillors wanted it, wanted it perhaps email to them directly so they could take it I, to. I don't think there's any harm in doing that. You, know, you if you're trying to engage the councillors. Some of the most popular stuff. I haven't got time to read that, but if it's a one pager, distributes you all your contacts, it might be, and it's just some out that we can get yep. um, with the events. Because yeah, we are putting stuff on, uh, as we're trying all that. Yeah, we, can. yeah we, we want to make sure we reach everything, because obviously with the way we've got in terms of poster sites and such at the moment, our reach is very much just in the centre of town. Yeah. for like offline stuff so if we can get it out to councils who are in different wards well, and know their own communities better than I do being I'm just like conscious that the mayoress made the offer of distributing possible Cloverfields uh, centre and if it goes to the mayor then you know, that's something which we can you know, bring to the like yeah, yeah we are pursuing the, um, uh, the mayoress's uh, offer to, to the Cloverfields church's um, community poster site 
Um, and that has sparked, uh, sparked our, you know, our drive to try and engage with other people that might be able to do that at the Abbey Centre, at the Child Burrow Centre, at, um, at various different meetup cafe and things like that. So we'll explore that. As, as venues start to reopen because of the lifting of the restrictions, we'll also go back to those who over well, nearly 18 months ago were quite keen to put um, information in their, in their different retail outlets. Um, some of the coffee shops have got community poster sites and things like that, so we need to we need to put them in there. And obviously, we are going to reopen our tea room. We also have discussed within the team that um, maybe we can, from time to time, have a, uh, a gazebo on the market um, to do some sort of you know um, promotion in terms of what's up and coming. Not every week, but obviously, you know, once a month maybe, just to tell people what's actually. Uh, actually on as you'll see later in the in, in the agenda you know we've got lots of variety of events coming up and so we, we need to get that information out to them so that's good just a question for myself regarding the crossover between this committee and your role and the civic side and the mayor's posts so i did have a look on twitter I think the mayor's tweet um, we've still got brenda as the face of the thing there or the on the mayor's yeah, I don't run the mayor's Twitter. I don't have any. No, but so I think it's still at the front of the council, and we probably just, we I, do. We should aware of yeah, it. Yeah. So yeah. So we have changed the Facebook uh, post. So we just need to speak because I know um, Mike and Corinne are using um, someone to, to to help them and assist them with all their media posts, which is absolutely fine. And and that particular person did a great job because there's some really good post that's been that so I just, we'll just have to have a word with yeah. with her and just make sure that we can get that updated yeah. as well. Yep. Oh. Good. So, so, quick question. Thank you, Mr. Director. Um, at this point, I'm not sure, you know, my apologies, I don't even know if I'm one of the councillors who opened emails or not. Uh, but my question was, if, what, for the councillors, because you can see who opened them, do they go to our councillors' official work email yes. or go to our personal emails? Because the, the council has both actually, at least for me. Um, and usually, I mean, there's a huge amount of work email, so I was wondering if it is case to the test of town council, official yeah. council and email, if you give to both, to be honest. Uh, the well, the, the, of them, I may have missed something. Yeah. Well, um, I can remember you are one of the ones who did a criminal newsletter. <laughs> well, there you go. I tend to do open all my work but, ones but to try it, to keep up with things. But but I was wondering it, if it goes to the work one or not, because it yeah. makes a difference to me. Yeah. It goes to the work one. I mean, if councils would prefer, prefer it goes to their personal one, I'm happy. I'm just, yeah. I'm just wondering. Um, I'm happy to uh, request uh, that and then add it to a manual. I do recall some of the information, but I receive about 20 to 30 minutes of that as you get it. I, I, I think that's a good point. And I think what we need to do, Tom, is maybe contact all the councillors because this is different to sending out official business uh, information. This is something that will go out just yeah. to promote uh, what we're doing. Official meeting email, yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. So something different. If okay. councillors have a view that they'd like it to go to a personal email because they, they, they look at that more often, that's perfectly fine. So if we can contact all the councillors and ask what their preference would be, or, or even send it to both. I think that, yeah, both, because that way you're covering yourself that all councillors are getting it via the yeah, yeah. And then, as yeah. individuals, yeah, if they want to open it, they yeah. can get their yeah. yeah. That's, that's more fine by me. If we're sending it to both, is no issue because once it's added to the database, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just, yeah, I just need those emails and then that's fine. Okay, any questions? Well, I think it's a great idea. I mean, why not send it to both, um, you know, the, 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 the council and your private email? What's wrong with that? But, uh, you know, it's there and less chance of missing it. <clears throat> Fantastic, and it would be obviously appreciated because if that way then councillors see it, they can, you know, they can sort of feed it into their local communities as well, and just kind of make it a little yeah. bit easier to really get it out there. Yeah, add them to the list. Fantastic. Great. Further. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Now on to point nine twenty one venues events twenty 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 one. Okay, so um, so basically, at the last meeting, councillors asked whether they could be kept informed with the uh, the kind of events that we as a council are proposing to deliver, not not those who have hired our venues uh, and are delivering them as a uh, party. So 
Um, as Tom said earlier, you know, we have now got on board the um, Heritage and Town Events Officer uh, and as a team we're looking to develop a lot more events uh, in the future. So as you can see on the screen and as you have seen in the, in the notes that were circulated, there's several that have been planned and are currently being promoted at certain times through the marketing campaigns uh, that take us up to the end of this year. There are things that we're talking about and looking at um, for 2022 and at the next meeting we can bring those to the to the party with a little bit more fleshed out information so we can discuss those before we actually go forward. Um, but certainly there's a lot of variety there and you can see that um, the Guild Hall is going to play a big part in the delivery aspect of our event going forward. Uh, Katie has already um, uh, launched uh, the writing workshops, uh, the art and crafts groups that will meet on a weekly basis, um, the uh, music uh, workshops, etc., etc. So that's really good in terms of drawing in lots of different new elements of our community and developing a nice audience base. Katie came with a lot of uh, theatre and performance art based background and contacts, and to be fair to her, she's come up trumps. Uh, the first two, James McDermott is a, a script writer on the EastEnders uh, um, cast uh, schedule and uh, Atiya Sengupta is also um, a script writer that was on the uh, Skins uh, series. So two big um, TV type uh, series and dramas and soaps. So again, hopefully they'll attract um, some really uh, new audiences for us. So that's, that's quite nice. Also, again, I've always hoped that we could um, deliver a, a variety of activities, especially for the families. So during holiday times, we will have things like children's theatre, puppet shows, etc. And again, uh, as from September, we will kick off with a uh, children's puppet show, which is based and written by Katie around the Thetford folk, so the big, the big names within our heritage and history. Um, and also we've got um, a couple of theatre groups that will deliver uh, again another puppet show around Hansel and Gretel and a children's theatre uh, show uh, called The Time Traveller which is going to be quite an exciting thing that we're actually going to stage it here in the Carnegie because we're hoping it's going to make a, a bigger impact. Uh, again uh, looking at the tea room we talked uh, last uh, meeting about having smaller more intimate type performance arts and again, um, the first one will be Tales of the Hangman in the Guildhall Tea Room. So using the, uh, the picture of the judge's chair. Um, and again, you know, Medieval Banquet, Mad Hatter's Tea Party, those kind of things. Uh, one of the other things is um, the usual Battle of Britain concert was postponed this year, simply because the, um, even though COVID restrictions are lifting, the, the association was uh, reticent to, 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 you know, to take that forward this year. They hopefully will be back next year. But the military wives that were gonna sing at that concert were really keen to do something. So again, they're gonna come to the, car, um, to the Guildhall on the 10th of September to do a performance. So again, we'll be promoting that in the very near future. Um, lots of free events in terms of homes and cable on the marketplace through Heritage um, open day weekends uh, and also our TTC Christmas parties uh, that were really successful the year before Covid struck uh, and as I mentioned before a wider and more variety in terms of our Christmas celebrations around Christmas like switch on and beyond. So lots of things to look forward to. Um, I don't know what the uh, council's comments are there, whether they think we're going in the right direction or they would like to see something something else. Um, so over to Nicholas. No, I think this is why not. I'm quite actually happy that the new lady that did the post um, start to work with hands with the big culture to actually bring our shows that set in front of And I think it would overwhelm me in that, to be honest. So I, I'm, I'm happy to see a variety of other shows that can involve different age groups all in one under one group, which is which is always positive. Um, I don't have any for criticism to it. It seems, it seems okay. I mean, considering that we are in the post COVID era with everything is closed, I mean, this list of events, it seems, seems a reasonable uh, fair amount of uh, events being put on as, as a catch up mode 
Yeah. <clears throat> after the after all the lockdowns, and it, it seems uh, um, a, fair, a fairly populated <laughs> calendar. Let's put it this way. For for the circumstances and the times we're living in. So yeah, my 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 compliments to the new idea. It seems it seems like the program is quite there. So it's working. Yeah, I'm, I'm very impressed with the variety. I think it's an excellent effort, and uh, yeah, congratulations to those that really arranged it all. I mean, it's uh, great. I think it's great. <laughs> so, yeah, good variety. Uh, hopefully, we get good support. I, I think we have to be aware that you know, coming out of COVID, COVID after so many months, um, there's going to be people who are chomping at the bit to try and you know celebrate and get involved in and, and coming out. But there's also people that's going to be slightly sceptical mm -hmm. about getting back into normality really quick. So I think some of them are going to be a slow burn. So we, we've got to understand it might be, you know, a good couple of months before I think people feel confident. We will still maintain certain protocols to make people feel safe. One of the areas that we have talked about is uh, table service. I think we still would like to try and see whether that works for us. So therefore avoiding crowding at the bar and stuff such like. Um, so Hopefully with our podcast, we'll also do a couple of productions to ensure people that we've taken those precautions so they can feel confident to come out and attend events in the Carnegie and the Guildhall. So we'll wait and see, but we've, we've provided a nice variety of things. Yeah, I just think it's, it's a great um, content to run us up to the end of the year. We you know, are very grateful we've got Katie in post and has the confidence to pull some of that stuff together. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there an angle here we can attract a bit more publicity through the press? Because you've got these high profile writers to, you know, unfortunately, with the local press, you have to do all the work for them. Yeah. Um, and it's, if we, yeah. we've got the content, if we can write a, a little press release regarding, because they like to buy into these national figures. So if you've yeah. got things, EastEnders and Skins and that, yeah. these are kicking off our program events post lockdown, gives us a bit more of a oof. Uh, and then we can obviously drop in but we've got some other stuff coming on as well but I do think you know, you've only got that only next month which is only a few weeks away yeah. uh, we probably could do with a little bit more publicity to, to kick start it so I think it's worthwhile exploring yeah. um, they're usually grateful for a story the local press but you have to do the work for them yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'll take that forward to Katie and I'm sure we can get something sorted and I'm sure James and uh, Tia are quite happy to, to provide some information yeah. that we can use. Yeah, some quotes or something like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we move on now to venue reopening plans 19021. So uh, there's a couple of uh, agenda items here. So um, venues reopening are in, in this agenda item, I've sort of more concentrated on the Carnegie because we can pick up some of that with the Guildhall on the next agenda item. So in terms of reopening, uh, we are in a better position to reopen the Carnegie uh, in terms of reopening the Guildhall and I'll, I'll, I'll explain why uh, in the next agenda item, but certainly we have been chomping at the bit to reopen the doors to the Carnegie uh, as COVID struck in March 2020. We were on the verge of um, having a really good uh, pre-booking calendar of events and, and hires um, and it, it really struck us hard. So we have we've been chomping at the bit to try and open up. Again, we are seeing, a, you know, even, even after um, the government's uh, recent announcement only a few days uh, old. We are seeing a lot of activity in terms of people wanting to hire the venues and looking for free dates and things like that, which is really encouraging. And again, as I, I said a moment ago, we are also not planning to uh, ditch uh, COVID protocols um, too quickly. We want to make people feel comfortable and confident uh, that they can come into a safe environment. So Heidi High is one of our first events here in the Carnegie, which is Friday week. And that uh, event is based around table service. The second evening is an 80s, 90s event, uh, and that is going to be a completely different kind of uh, context. Um, so we do have to think about how we can avoid overcrowding at the bar, because hopefully that event will be reasonably popular, as they've shown in the past. Uh, and we will encourage people to um, follow sort of a queuing protocol in, in the bar area. We are also looking at our staff in the bar area so again 
Um, we've got um, people working on the bar at the moment that is going to facilitate the, um, the workstation uh, idea that we've discussed in the past. So people will be a little bit more um, static in the areas that they work behind the bar, so there's, not, there's less crossover, there's less bumping into each other, uh, so therefore safer for our staff to work in those situations as well. Um, so yes, as of, um, as of Monday the 19th, the doors are open, the restrictions are lifted to a degree in terms of events that we can do, and we're going to go um, full tilt to try and uh, introduce those um, events in the next few weeks. So again, any questions? It just occurs to me that um, with the um, relaxing of restrictions, some of the people that might want to attend are looking forward to that relaxation. And I'm wondering if we might be overstating the necessity to keep apart on things. I mean, if, is there some sort of, um, have you already arranged a, a compromise between the total freedom and the old guidelines? It's a good point, Ken. I don't, I don't think, I, I apologise if I didn't come across uh, clearly. It's not the fact that, I mean, obviously there is no um, restrictions on people mixing at tables, so you don't have to keep in your six or, or your bubbles. They're, they're, they've been relaxed. So in terms of people coming to the event, I think um, they won't see a difference when they're in this room if they're coming to a dance or, or a theatre show. But clearly there are times when we have 200 odd people in this room, the bar area is quite compact. We don't want necessarily 50 people all hanging over each other at the bar. So we will encourage them to be a little bit more sensible in that uh, area, which I'm sure people would want to do anyway. Apart from that, I don't think they will be, you know, there's anything necessarily that, that we will inflict on them that will spoil their event. There will be hand sanitizers around, there will, you know, that kind of thing. So there'll be the sensible precautions, but nothing that we hope will deter people coming that want to just... And what, what's the mechanics for encouraging this caution? How would you do it? Is it signage or...? Well, it's, it's certainly signage. It's certainly pre-information pre, um, pre in terms of some of our um, videos and podcasts and things like that. But the message is that, you know, we're, we're moving back into the realms of normality. We want people to come back out and enjoy and, uh, and celebrate their events. But for those who are feeling a little bit less confident, you know, rest assured that there are enough protocols and as long as people have common sense, um, then they can come and enjoy themselves. I think that's the message. So, um, yeah, so hopefully people who just want to get there out, get out there and celebrate are not going to think that they're going to be restricted to the point where they're not going to really enjoy it. That's, okay. not, the, that's not the option. Thank you, David. Okay. So, Heritage Hub. So <coughs> firstly, uh, the works update. Um, I've been on holiday for a couple of weeks, so the first thing I did when I returned on Monday is <laughs> I did go straight out onto the external works of the Guildhall. <laughs> And actually, I was really uh, pleased to see the um, progress that they've made. And, um, and it's looking really, really fantastic. Uh, I mean, the ramp is, uh, is, is really wide. Uh, and, it, you know, I know when we were looking at architects' plans all those many months ago, I think some of the councillors were saying that we have to sort of future-proof this. Mobility scooters are getting more wider and cumbersome and things like that. I'm not being funny that you could get a light aircraft up that ramp. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's really good. So I'm just thinking, even if, it, if you're a young mum with a pushchair and another little one holding your hand, they're going to feel safe going up that ramp. So I'm really, really pleased. The standard of work is fantastic. So the new contractors have done a grand job. Um, I know uh, Jane. Uh, has got a, an event on Friday, I think it's the 23rd, 23rd or 24th of July, Friday week. Um, she's got a book launch in the Guildhall and the contractors, well we are absolutely 100% confident that that will go ahead. Uh, it could, we could open the doors this Friday. Um, so the contractors are now starting to clear up some of the, uh, the mess out there if you like to just try and tidy up the, the environment. Um, but they will, they will be even further ahead by Friday week. So most of the um, bullnosing is done, the safety um, uh, 
air threads on the bull nosing for uh, visually impaired um, attendees are, are all being installed at the moment. The only thing I don't think will be there are the uh, railings down the new steps and it might be that we just allow people into the building via the ramp only and just protect that area until we get the railings in even though they're wide enough and uh, easy enough to, to manoeuvre I think people do would like to support handrail so I think we'll we will we will just bring people in via the ramp for those particular events um, so tea room we are interviewing uh, for the tea room supervisor on Friday so we should have someone in post by next week and I anticipate by mid-August we will be opening the doors to the Guildhall Tea Room. So by mid-August I think we will be back to opening the doors um, as, we, as we will do normally. So, um, but there will be several events up to the middle of August but that's our deadline to, to sort of open the doors uh, in, the, in the wider context of using the, the facility. So uh, really pleased with the progress. Um, in terms of the official launch, what we will use these initial events for is, is what we've classed as soft launch events. So it gives us the opportunity to iron out any little teething problems because there's been a lot of reconfiguration of the interiors, etc. And we will use the Heritage Open Day weekend. So from the 11th of September to the 19th of September, we've got a lot of events planned for that. So we are anticipating a big audience attendance through that particular week and we will have an official launch event during that spell. So councillors, contractors, VIPs, uh, the lottery funded uh, officials, they will all be um, invited in to, um, to open officially the Guild Hall, although it will be open before then for these soft events. So hopefully that's in, uh, that meets with Councillor's approval. Uh, happy to take any questions on that. Just, so just in terms of the internal works, they be yep. we're looking at heritage, we're looking for tenders for people to help you know, put those displays up. Yep. Is it envisaged we get those all done by the official launch? Well, it, I mean, to be honest. You've, you've looked at the tenders as well. I have. But I, I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that there is one or two people that, it, I must admit, I looked at the, uh, the timetable of implementation of those interpretation displays and, it, and some of them were talking about well into 2022. Uh, fortunately, there are a couple who uh, are, probably will mean that we can have a lot of stuff within by the um, by mid September, I think it's going to be a process to get it where we want to be. Uh, it won't be. It will probably be early 2022 where we could say that this is the venue as we envisage we wanted it. But certainly by um, the mid September official launch, people will sufficiently see what difference has been has been made. Certainly the reconfiguration of the toilets, the facilities have been vastly improved. But you're right. We've called it the Guildhall Heritage Hub. <coughs> it's a bigger, it's a bigger project than that. It's a bigger picture than that. And we do, we will have things in there that we can, we can say that this is what we're celebrating. Rooms are themed. We're celebrating what we class as our Thetford uh, folk, if you like, the stories of the Thetford folk. Um, and we will have enough sufficient to sort of show people when they come to the official launch. So I'm just conscious if we have a lottery people there, they yeah. need to have this taste of the yeah. heritage bits and be delivered. <laughs> yeah. And also what I think we ought to do, actually taking up on that point then, Stuart, uh, because you know, some of the uh, car exports are very cheap to so maybe whoever is the winning tender, some of their designs we could blow up and say, look, this is where we are at the moment, these are the rooms that we're theming, these are the stories that we're telling. And this is a process we're going through now. So this room will look like this in the future, in the very near future. Um, but you can see that we're making good progress. So I think that's actually, that's a really good, good thing. Okay, moving on then. One, one, two. So part of our terms of reference is that we need to review uh, market tolls and venue fees annually. Uh, so this agenda item is to review um, the, what we 
will determine the market tolls would be from uh, April 2022 through to March 2023. Uh, currently our market tolls are at the rates of regular traders are £1.16 per square metre and a casual trader is £1.73 per square metre. Regular traders are those who pay a month in advance they, um, and they get certain privileges that they can dictate where their pitch is within the market square etc. Casual traders have to pay a little bit more but they get the uh, option that if they don't want to attend on a particular day um, that's their prerogative uh, and they you know they haven't fronted up any money that they potentially could lose for whatever reason but they obviously pay a little bit more for that um, that facility so uh, it, it's also um, <clears throat> right for me to say that as, as I said we review this annually the tolls haven't increased for the last three consecutive years and the last time it was increased it was increased by only five percent and I say that because regularly we get a lot of stick on uh, social media publicly about how our rates are prohibitive of stallholders being able to trade a Thetford market as I've said in the past um, mar outdoor markets are struggling nationally uh, there is probably one market in, in, in our area, in our media area, that's bucking the trend and, and I, I, I make no bones and pleased to say that it's Swaffham. Swaffham are doing very well, um, but I wouldn't say that they're doing well because they are vastly cheaper than our market tolls. It just means that the people in Swaffham um, are happy to support their market. Market traders are, like any retail um, trader, they, they are dependent on footfall and we do need to try and attract footfall into the town centre in lots of different ways so our market traders as well as our, our retail traders, traders can benefit and that's one of the reasons why this group has talked about using the market square for a wider social aspect in, in terms of events and things like that. And that's what we will be doing. We'll be looking at trying to in, improve the market with that social aspect, with, with additional um, music maybe and things like that to attract people. And hopefully um, the market traders will do better and they will, they'll be more supported with, with footfall. Uh, we've got a, a specialist market um, on Sunday the 1st of August, which we've dubbed as under the clock tower. So it's, it's a a rejig of, of the night markets. We've not called it a night market for obvious reasons, it's in the afternoon. But it is a mix of food, arts and crafts stalls and music. And hopefully people will come along on that Sunday and enjoy the day. Um, so it's those kind of things that we're trying to do. So in terms of the market toll fees, um, again, they are struggling. They are struggling in terms of footfall, it's not their fault. We need to up our game and try and promote it a little bit better. Um, so I don't know what councillors uh, feel about um, looking at um, increasing the rates. We haven't increased it for three years, we've done our part. Um, or one of the proposals is, this is all gonna be part of the budget setting process that we're gonna uh, talk about in September. And that's the reason why we review these fees and tolls at this time of year. So it gives me an option to try and start presenting the budget to councillors in September as our first round of budget setting. But it also gives me an opportunity, if councillors so wish, to try and review the system of tolls. So at the moment, at the moment markets have a very, very different ways of, of, of how they determine the fees to the to the traders. Ours is a per square metre fee. Others sometimes are on a grid fee. So it makes it a lot easier for people to understand. If you say to someone it's £1.16 per square metre with respect, they might think, well how much is that going to cost? How much you know I'm oh I don't know, I'm not sure whether I really want to commit to that. If you say look a three by three metre gazebo is £12.50 they understand it a bit more and they think £12.50 I think that's worth taking a chance to come down and see whether I can make a go of it at Thetford. So whether we revert to that grid system fee, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm happy to spend some time before September to try and offer up a proposal. 
uh, and, um, and factor that into two budget scenarios rather than just take a decision on increasing the toll or based on square metre. I don't know what you think, Chair. Uh, yeah, I think it's got points and papers first. And well, on. personally, I prefer the grid uh, system, a, a, a preset area, yeah. um, <clears throat> with some sort of regimented design whereby people have got good f f you know, access on foot, etc., push chairs and things. But um, may I ask, is there vacancies in effect with regard to market space on a Saturday, say? There's, there's definitely market uh, space. Uh, and we have had a few inquiries. I, I've got two uh, that I've answered uh, this week that people have come forward and asked whether there, there is a space to, to attend at the market. And I've gone back to them and given them the, the charges um, and hopefully you know they'll come along and, and, and give it a go. Yeah. But certainly we can accommodate all stores on both Tuesday and Saturday. Yeah. So I suppose really it boils down to some sort of supply and demand, I guess, that if we're going to put the prices up, for instance, and we're still trying to get people to make use of the space, we might be sort of swimming against this. Uh, you know, I, I think we've got to think carefully about yeah. price increase. It may have to go hand in hand with the redesigning of the, the description of the area that they can use. I think that the per square metre is difficult. It makes you wonder if you if there's a limit to how much space you can use. Is there a limit? Have we got some sort of limit in terms of space? I see some people seem to have, like one guy there has got the the uh, big area of well, uh, there, there is there is not a limit. I mean, you know, traditionally the bigger stores on on any market tend to be fruit and veg because, especially the fruit and veg that come on a Saturday, they have a wide variety of product that they that they sell, which is great for for the public uh, because it's great a choice, and therefore they need um, a larger store. So as long as we can fit them into the space, you know, that, that's not going to preclude them to come and trade at Thetford. Um, in terms of, and I probably know the trade you, 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 you're talking about, there is a fine balance, Ken, and I think sometimes we've made it difficult for ourselves, but with certain traders, that if we have fast space because we've gone through a process of losing a couple of traders, they've come and give it a go, footfall is not enough, they've had an offer to go to another market and they've taken up that option, then rather than portray an empty market, we've been a little bit lenient. With the consensus of the rest of the traders, we've been a little bit lenient with traders to say, if you want to edge out of your zone a bit, just to fill it, and just to give the perception that we are a reasonable size market. On the, on the premise that if we do take more traders in, they then have to restrict back to their so I, th I think that's a, a license that we've taken just to try and create a perception of a busy market. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But we have good relationships with most of the traders, all of the traders here, so they know they're under no illusion that if, if I say, well, actually, we've got three or four new inquiries, they're going to come along, you're going to need to go back to your original space. It's a double-edged sword for them. Yes, all right, you can spread out a bit more product out, but also, they want a vibrant market just as much as us. Absolutely. So they're quite happy to see new traders there because it'll encourage people to come down and, and, uh, and have a look. But I just think we, we're, in a, we're in a situation now where we've talked about it on several occasions, whether we can just look at a different system. Yeah. And in that respect, probably just try and tweak uh, where the schools are positioned to try and create a better environment. So the particular trader that I think we're both talking yeah. about, what, what size pitch do they actually pay for? They actually pay for something like um, sort of six, six metres by four metres. And there's times when, yeah, with respect, he's probably taken another third mm. or another half of that again. Uh, but he's not the only trader. There are other traders that Absolutely. are allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, so it would be unfair just to think it's one. There, there are a few that have been allowed to do that. And that's been with, you know, based on that reasoning. Oh. Yeah, um, I'm a trader of, you know, going back to the grid system. I think it's much more, um, it's easier for the people to understand. Look, if you have a gazebo of such and such size, it's going to cost you X. 
if you have a trailer or truck, this size is going to cost you what? Gives you gives people a mental image right away of the of the numbers. I mean, ultimately, it's about whether or not they can make a profit. There's going to be they're going to decide whether or not they're going to come to test with. Um, obviously, the more the merrier. <laughs> it's good for the traders and for the town. Um, but I do think that the grid um, price list would be pretty easy. Um, it, it makes sense to allow people to expand a little bit. If you have a split tenancy, it is really a better aesthetic, make it look a bit more cool. As long as they're, they're um, clear and they sign an agreement that they're paying for a certain amount of space, and then they have to go back yeah. to that to do the constraint of that space. Uh, if there's more people in the market, then there's no problem. I just think it makes people's lives easier, really. And then more. So historically, we did have a, a grid system many years ago, yes. and um, we then got into situations where sometimes I was paying for this for that, um, <laughs> but I only taken up this amount, yeah. so therefore, why should I pay for two grid spaces when I only got this? Mm -hmm. So that's where we went to the, the square footage. And you do have instances where the wagons are different sizes, different shapes, uh, and even the stalls themselves are not standard uh, yeah. zero size ones. And we've got a situation at the moment where we're looking to close the marketplace to traffic, we're going to have the steps eating into the space. That I think it's probably, my view would be to let it be as it is for this year, but during the course of the time, once we get open, look at the configuration of it, because we're looking at the marketplace in January, yeah. by putting PowerPoints in uh, along there, and, and how that's going to work, the potential um, usage of people on the marketplace itself wanting to use space there. Uh, so I think it's an interaction there that we need to, to look at. Right, okay. then go straight to a grid system now. I think that would be worthwhile to explore that. Okay, so see. there. So in terms of tolls, what I propose would be to leave it as it is for this year, but then giving you the opportunity to revisit it over the next um, period. That sounds it makes sense. I mean, if you want to reformulate the, the price list, it makes sense to do it after we know exactly the final the final setup yeah. plan of the marketplace. You know, to put the computer, the electric plan, and all that goes with it. So, if we need to hold on to make a decision to make sure we get everything in place, and then it's easy to even to allocate to make, to make a, a design of what that grid or how and where the is going to park the servers, and to be able to price them for it. So, yeah, we can park the idea on the site for one more year. Continuous and routine, and then once the whole marketplace is set up, then okay, we I think, the price. I think also, you know, David's made reference to we're not full, so we still need to try and encourage people in. Yeah. Um, and if we are in position this time next year that the Guild Hall tea rooms open, we've got a bigger footfall happening, I think we'll be in a better yeah, position to, to, to then mm -hmm. sell that to mm -hmm. the, the traders to say, look, you know, you're now a bit more buoyant. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, makes sense. Fine. Yeah. Fine. The proposal was to keep the status quo for one year. For this year, and then we'll but during the course of this ongoing year, in conjunction with the layout of the marketplace, yeah. um, we can come forward with it. Well, we've got an agenda item which talks about priorities, yeah. so we'll, we'll, we can do yeah. those out there. So, yeah. we'll have to so have we don't have any sold that year. Yeah, that's well, all. Yeah. 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 So, can I just have a proposal and a second? Thank you, Carl. Second. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> it's the one that you want to do, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> we go through the motion pretty quick. <laughs> so, uh, so similarly, the next agenda item, which is a review of venue fees, again, it's within our terms of reference, but we do these annually. Uh, again, we, we haven't uh, um, increased these uh, in terms of monetary values, although we did tweak um, the way that we constructed our weekday rates and our weekend rates. If you remember um, a couple of years ago, again pre-COVID, we looked to say that Friday, Saturday and Sunday were our weekend uh, events. So we, we kept both the Friday, which was outside the weekend rate, we included that into the weekend rate. So the weekend rates currently for the Carnegie, for instance, are £30 an hour. Uh, weekday rates for the Carnegie are £25 an hour and both have concession values of £5 underneath that figure. Um, it, again, it's reasonably competitive with most of our, um, with most of the venues similar size to us who are offering the same kind of thing to us. 
Uh, again, we're very much mindful of the fact that our objective is to fill this place, to make it busy all day, every day, seven days a week. Uh, and if you can, if you make a comparison with other venues, I think we are there or thereabouts to those similar sizes. So even though we haven't raised the fees, again, I would like to suggest that again for this year, we we propose that we don't increase it, Chair. Um, I think we're coming out of COVID. We want to encourage people back. And then next year, when we've got a vibrant Carnegie and Guildhall, we might be able to just tweak it slightly uh, then. But we have to be mindful that we are trying to encourage people back after 15, 16 months of inactivity. Again, the, uh, the Guildhall, um, the rates are uh, for the large call £20 for weekday, £25 for weekend, and £5 reductions on both of those figures for concessions. And again, Yes, it's a, it's a vastly improved space, but again, we want to encourage people to come and see and use the facility. Um, so again, I wouldn't like to sort of try and take advantage at this moment in time to raise fees that might discourage people to do that without actually trying the venue out. Do we have uh, the differential between daytime and evening? No, we don't. We don't, because that, I mean, again, I know there are a couple of venues not too far away from, from us that actually do that. So it's not just about a weekday and a week a weekend rate. They will have up to five o'clock, there'll be another rate, and then over five o'clock, there'll be a different rate. Whether we want to go down that route, I'm not sure. Well, it could be similar to what we've just been talking about with the, with the, with the market tolls. Maybe that's something we look at over yeah. the year. Um, but again, you know, I just want to stress again, you know, we're coming out of COVID, we've, we've had a 15, 16 month inactivity, we want people back in the, in the buildings. Yeah. I'm a bit more complicated, I'm quite happy to support that proposal to keep it throughout the year. I think in 12 months time, hopefully you'll get an idea of where your regular bookers and that are, where your holes are. So if you've got it pretty much vacant during the, the day, then we've got to be looking to try and encourage something. I know that people work and uh, don't pay the evenings, but you know, it might be that we do then offer a differential to, to, to encourage to fill those homes. So I'm happy to you know go with your suggestion of reading it for 12 yeah. months. Our members can be happy with that. Yeah. Oh, you don't look too happy. No, 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 I was just saying, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, considering that we're in post COVID and we're trying to encourage people to come out, and there are. I'm, I'm sure you'll find that um, some people that have booked those rental spaces, they, they fold it or they stop mm. operating altogether during the, um, the lockdowns because they're just no longer, they didn't survive lockdowns. But in the meanwhile, there will be other groups and other little companies and, and associations, immersion groups, that will want to get out there and start. Um, obviously, as we lost well some, we gained some, we have to make it affordable and actually encourage people to take the leap of faith and, and start something new and start using the spaces. So I think we should maintain the, I agree, we should maintain the rights for now. Encourage people to get out there and do something, being active, proactive, rather than making it difficult for them. At least for a year, it's time for things to get, to get the ball rolling, to get things back on as they were. I must admit, one of the frustrating things pre-COVID uh, was that <coughs> we were starting to make inroads in daytime use for conferencing, and we had some really big organisations that were coming here on the basis that they'd done some research. They'd been given a, a directive from on high to, to say that you know certain companies had to use community venues um, rather than you know flashy hotels or stately homes for conferencing. Um, and we provided something that was, was a decent venue, a decent size, at a very good rate of, of, of hire. And we started to pick up some really good bookings and then of course COVID come and impacted on all of that. The good thing is there is one of the uh, big organisations that has already made contact uh, and they want to start thinking about how they can come back. The other good thing about Fetford is we're equidistant from Kings Lynn, Ipswich, Cambridge, Norwich, etc. And this particular organisation has engineers uh, around the eastern region, so they bring them in for training conferences to Thetford. 
Um, the NHS were another. We, we were working with the Cambridgeshire, Suffolk and Norfolk NHS Foundation Trusts and they were bringing uh, staff members into to various different training conferences and they were a classic one that was being given a directive to, to try and you know, manage their budgets in, in a more viable way. So we provide an attractive um, rate of hire to these kind of organisations. So I think we're going down the right route at least for the, for the next year. Just one more thing, I speak up on my film story set regarding the big time and the time in England. I think that's actually very relevant. Um, it, it, I, would, I would imagine that it's a very different type of hire or, or a group or, or a company that's going to take on a specific day, say for, for a training session or, or a, a yoga class. So I'm amazing where you can get, get 100 or 150 people attending a theatre production or a concert or something like that, where the profit and the purpose of the event are completely different. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't see somebody that puts on a theatre show or, or a concert in the evening wanting to even rent in the room to that either. So they would have no option. That's, that's their. There's that core audience and that's why they do. They are they will always rent in the evening anyways. I think because of the amount of people and the type of event that tends to come during the versus evening, it would uh, it would uh, be logical to have a different price rate after a certain time uh, in the afternoon. Uh, I don't know if that would have to be seasonal, like for example Christmas times or the other across the summer where there's more concerts and more people coming out. I say I suppose that's open to, to discussion, but it would make sense to me. To have a more flexible, affordable daytime rate for smaller groups and associations versus an evening, an evening rental um, for big events. So I think I think that would be useful to build that knowledge base of where we could, as you say, we're just coming out of COVID until we know what the market's going to settle at. And I think then you know, come back this time next year to say, well, we're actually you know, only rent base in the half the time, we will encourage the Daytime use and was it drop it or not increase it? So I think I think the proposal would be to leave as we are for twelve months and look at that. Um, so okay, year. I can see a pattern building up here. We're going to leave it all in simmering on the pot on the back burner <laughs> because we are edgy about what's going to happen yeah, we'll, this year. But then again, we don't know. We are we are sort of striving carefully because obviously it's very new and there will be people who are jumping to the wagon to be out there doing things. So we are going to wait to get out of the house because they're still quite wary of being out in public. So you know, you made a good point in that. So I suppose we 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 are, we are to sort of thread carefully. Just, just really giving people the confidence to come up and do things. But you know, we can always really get those things out there, you know, no harm in it. So, if we're happy we resolve that in the same way. Yeah, same way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and then, no problem. Um, yeah. Thank you. Eight one nine four twenty one. In communication. Oh, so, okay. So, it? So, sorry. Okay, this agenda item really is is an important part of what will become budget setting for 2022-2023. So we just need to revisit um, our, our sort of outline priorities of what we want to try and um, try and achieve during that during that time, and then look at over the next few months as we go through budget setting. What are those capital projects that we need to try and uh, think in terms of how to achieve those ultimate um, statements of intent, priorities, um, by investing in this, this or this? So again, it's part and parcel of the budget process. So for instance, you know, as a committee, we are responsible for the Carnegie, the Guildhall, St. Peter's Church and the Market Square, and also the wider communications of the of the town council so um, you know should there be a sort of a, a statement of intent for each of those for instance we could say for the Carnegie we've over the years made several big investments in this venue to improve it uh, for our hirers and attendees so to continue to improve the Carnegie to be recognized as one of the area's premier community venues there are areas that we still need to look at if we really want to attain that that kind of status, I mean, we've we've talked about the bar could be improved. Certainly, the outside entrance could be improved. We do need to do some uh, repairs to the roof. So, if we did have that statement of intent, then beneath beneath that would be capital projects pertaining to those kind of of areas. And what is the costs that we might have to look into the setting of our budgets? In terms of the Guildhall, it's, a, it's 
it's to support the continued development of the Guild Hall as a result of what we've done through uh, NHLF funding. Um, but there are areas that are beyond that funding remit. For instance, um, it is an antiquated heating system in there. We've just had an environmental audit. They will. They say that you know we will have um, commitments to the government commitments to try and change that in the in the future. So again, we need to be ahead of the game and thinking about how we can do that. So um, we are going to have to look at changing that, that heating oil system, and we could then look to try and install something very similar to this. But how do we do it? What's the cost? So again, we need to look at that. The guild doors you see in the view have got beautiful large windows, but with that means that <laughs> there's a hell of a lot of light that infiltrates some of the rooms. So if you're going to use it for theatre productions and things like that, you need to have sort of um, blackout curtain type uh, scenarios. And again, they don't come cheap for, for windows the size of the guild hall. So again, we could be looking at something something like that. Um, and again, we've talked about the marketplace being a, uh, a more safer and vi vi vibrant public realm as opposed to just a car park. We, have, we are currently looking at uh, the cost of installing additional electric points on the Guildhall Street side of the market, but is there anything else that we should be looking at? In a, in a recent visit from English Heritage, uh, they alluded to funding that might be available to, um, to vastly improve the uh, the streetscape, if you like, for want of a better term, of the tarmacking, so that could be um, cobbled or, or, uh, or such like, uh, to make it more of a appealing to um, to an open public realm space. And then finally, St Peter's Church, there's a massive commitment that we need to continue and drive um, to uh, to create the repairs that are definitely needed to that venue. Uh, again, you know, it's, at, it's on the at-risk register. So we need to make sure that we, we refurbish um, the building as, as we are committed to doing, uh, and then allow um, a more viable meanwhile use in there to attract further funding and some community support. So they're the kind of statements of intent that are, I'm suggesting that we can underpin with the capital project investments that will go to obtain those, achieve those statements of intent. And that's all part of the budget centre. So that's all I've got to say on that, Chair. I don't know whether there's any yeah, comments. Yeah, I just find it, it difficult. You want to be succinct in your priorities to yeah. give you something manageable to, to tick off. But at the same time, you don't want to tie your hands in, you know, if you do have an opportunity to improve something, um, you want it to fit to your major priorities. So I, I think you have the idea of maintaining this building, looking for yeah. improvements. Keeping it watertight if you've got to make a hole in the roof, you know, it's no good to you if it's leaking. There. The other thing is, is to, you touched upon it, is promoting it as a venue, not just to people of Bedford, but to the wider East Anglia as a place where sometimes I'm kind of you're going to go there. You know, it's a, we're getting things happening, um, we're marketing it, we talked about that earlier, and I, I just think, you know, raising the profile of coming to Guildhall as a destination for people to come visit it is something we need to build into this um, there. The Guildhall, um, the fabric of the building concerns me. We've done a lot of work on the outside for access and that. We've got cracks and that need filling up. We've got a gutter that we all need to do it on the side here. That's, the stonework's been eroded. Um, the towers are uh, in need of um, public. So that fabric seems to be a, a high priority as a part of that. But it, could be wrapped up in your general statement about yeah. you know maintaining the fabric of the building and making it presentable and useful um, because if it's leaking water you know, down the side you're yeah. storing up problems for the future I think so. So can I suggest Chair yeah, then if councillors are happy that um, that you and I get together to try and to try and create those statements of intent if you like those uh, and then when we come back in September, because I think that's our next meeting, we don't meet in August usually, but we could do. Um, we can then have a, a general discussion of what we need to physically do. You, you, you've alluded to the repairs of the external guild or things like that, that achieve that statement of intent, that, that commitment to doing it. 
and from that we can then factor in costs. Yeah. Um, so I do all think you know, stuff that we're, we're not aware of opportunities for stroke liabilities that may come to pass. Yeah. But I think if you've got a general heading, this is what we're aiming for. Yeah. And then give examples of things that we know and cost those knowns. Yeah. That gives you your feet in your budget side so that you can then look for monies for those things. And I think it's as much as you can really do. If you're happy with that. Absolutely. Yeah. <coughs> Moment considering they're very generic um, to really look at what really is the priority. And we spend much a fair amount of money to sort of read the list of priorities um, and, and just sort of work through them as, as, a, as a council and really need to know to have a full view of what's. So, what's if, if we can highlight the, the, the major items that we know of yes. as, as is under that major heading, yeah, that we're going to track them up. The only other question is you're know, saying the next thing will be September. Um, so this is one thing I, I, I agree, just to say that there's one and a half hours that I won't be able to attend for family and all other reasons. Um, but if there is one, then by all means I will not stop doing it because I'm not present. If that's the case, I'll try to log in online on the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Traditionally, we don't, we don't do it. Um, I don't think there's any. I mean, call, call a special meeting. Uh, I'll follow it up. Um, but, uh, I yeah, exactly. But it's not to say that if Stuart and I haven't worked on some of this that we can't email around no. it. So you've still got a, a oh, yeah. few weeks My before audience, we meet in sure. September to make any comments. Yeah, yeah. we'll get any communications always So that's just an action then, Chris. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. That's fine. Okay. Moving on then. On my side. Community engagement. <laughs> We've talked about a press release yeah. on um, opening up the good events that we've got there. Obviously, going forward, once you know a bit more about September, we'll have something on the lot to put out there. Uh, any other suggestions? Are we doing a generic, some kind of saying that we're open for business because you know, following Boris's thing? Well we spoke well we did speak about that earlier in the week about maybe that's our next podcast really, our next yeah. video to take out there that we can say that um, you know we are open for business. We, we you know we're we're pleased and encouraged by the government's announcement and we're you know we're chomping at the bit to reopen and welcome you to the Carnegie and the and the, and the newly refurbished Guild Hall. Tom's got it down. Well, uh, me and Kate were gonna film that this afternoon after There you go. <laughs> well done. Okay. Then because we're not meeting till September but we hopefully will have the works completed on the steps yeah. on the guild wall. Is there some way of doing some kind of press that saying that officially be opened in September, but you know, the, the, the works are completed? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And you can see things coming back to mm. the, the new perspective. Just to keep the thing on the board, or rather yeah. than people not know what's going on. Right. Just going to make a point that. Uh, if we are helping the community by freezing all fees in markets and in, in buildings, then the public should be aware of it. Yeah. Because there was, a, there was an, um, an obligation, there was an option. You, we chose to keep it that way, to facilitate and encourage people yeah. to use and facilitate it to the public to group. So perhaps a note on one of those newsletters or not any other medium like a, a, a Facebook post or, or even on the, the, the town council website itself to say, to all traders and hires, we are we are supporting you and coming back and, and we open your activities. We want to see, we're looking forward to see you and to greet you back. And we have frozen all fees for another year to facilitate yeah. and welcome. Yeah, I, think I think that would go a long way with getting people into the market and to the spaces. You know, if you, when you speak about start freezing fees, people say, oh, okay, so they're not going to charge me anymore to come back. So, you know, yeah. don't take a look and say, yeah, let's go back. It's just, it's just a matter of opinion, but I think it could probably help. Okay, then. One nine six twenty one committee officers update. No, nothing further. No. Okay, well thank you very much for your attendance and uh, being closed. Thank you. <laughs>